two, or I should say uh, homework, I'm sorry, part three, homework series 1.3. All right, um, so this is last in the series, so you can kind of expect the problems are going to get a little more difficult, a little, uh, uh, but you should be able to answer these questions well if you've done the first two homeworks. And so hopefully you're not starting with 1.3, this should be how you end. And so it's like your last kind of like test, you're ready for to take this exam. Um, if not, some studies, some studies warranted, go back and check out the first two homeworks. Uh, make sure that you did them in, in earnest um, and with total validity, meaning that you just didn't listen to me talk or just see what I did and copy it down because, frankly, that's not going to help you on the test. You have to know how to do these, to do these things if you expect to do well on my tests, right? Anyway, so let's get to it. And so the first question asks you to identify formula. And so this is, again, a culmination event. So now that you have done this several times, um, you should have fallen back on some um, good formula to use. Um, so identify a formula used to prove lines are parallel. Well, remember, parallel lines mean that the slopes are the same. Um, if the slopes are the same, that means you have to be able to find slope. Um, and so in this particular case, you got to use some slope formula. Now, depending on the situation, uh, there's several different slope formula. Um, the one that we're using most is, let's say, you just have points on a grid, or maybe I'm just giving you points is going to be the y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 business. Now, if you're given a grid, you can certainly think of this in terms of rise over run, which means you can draw those triangles, which is the same thing as understanding how you find the change in y over how you find the change in x. Um, so depending on uh, which situation you have, excuse me, any of these could be applicable. Now, luckily for the second problem, um, I'm asking you something very, very similar. I want, I want you to know if lines are going to be perpendicular. Well, perpendicular means that you have opposite reciprocal slopes. Um, slope being the key word here, which means um, we're going to use slope formula again. And so it looks like slope form is going to be a fairly important thing to us because it's how you calculate slope. In terms of knowing if they're per parallel, perpendicular, or in some cases neither, you have to have the slopes in front of you and then start making some choices about what to do. Okay? Um, lines are congruent. Well, lines are congruent mean that you need to find lengths. Uh, lengths means lengths means that you have a couple different situations. Uh, the first thing you can do is to use a distance formula. Distance formula demands a very particular set of inputs, namely a couple points um, that you probably have because what the distance you're trying to find is on the grid. Um, so the way this is going to look um, is we'll take the x1 minus x2, square it up, add this to the y1 minus y2 squared up, and that's going to be our distance formula. Uh, the second thing we can use is Pythagorean theorem. Okay. Um, Pythagorean theorem, of course, is going to be a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Um, the context on this one, of course, is different. Um, we're going to be using that if you just say have a right triangle or can create one. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so we want to show the segments A, B, and C, D are perpendicular, but we also want to show they're not congruent. Um, so there's a couple of different things we have to do, uh, perpendicularity and congruency. Now, uh, luckily, we just talked about what it takes to actually show something is perpendicular, and of course, we've been practicing that um, in class the last couple days. Um, so if we have something that's perpendicular, we're going to have to interpret the slope. Congruency, we're going to have to interpret the length. And so for me, the, probably the best thing we can do is decide on right away what formulas we're going to use. Um, I would honestly use, since we have the grid, I would actually use um, just counting techniques on the grid itself. Um, so what I mean is if we look at AB, um, we can kind of form a right triangle around it, two, three, four, um, and that triangle's dimensions are four and two. Uh, and then if we have this other segment CD, we can again do the same exact thing. Uh, again, doing the count, one, two, three, four, and then down two. Okay. Now, in terms of finding their slopes, um, we just have to, again, apply the what we know about slopes. Um, we don't need the, the y2 minus y1 formula since we have the rise and the run here. And so let's make a, a little note here. So we want the slopes. Okay, so for AB, uh, the slope the same as change in y over change in x, a rise over run. Um, that's going to be plus 4, because it goes from a to b, it goes up 4, and then it goes plus 2 over. Um, 4 over 2 is just going to be 2. 
um, for CD. Um, the slope we can figure the same way since we're using slope triangles here. Um, from C to D, my change in Y actually drops 2. Um, and then the run in this case is going to be plus 4. And so doing a little simplification here, negative 2 over 4 is the same thing as negative 1 over 2. Okay, um, and so this question asks it to show the perpendicular. And so we have to really evaluate the slopes here a little more carefully. If we look at the first one, I'm going to go ahead and turn it into a fraction over 1. You can turn anything to a fraction over 1. And sometimes it's helpful to do so. Um, if we look at these two slopes side by side, we can make an observation. And the observation we can make is that they, they actually are um, opposite reciprocals. Now, remember, opposite reciprocals is, uh, is a signature for per perpendicular slopes or perpendicular lines. Um, opposite reciprocal means is that the fraction has been flipped and the signs have changed. And that's what's happened here. 2 over 1 became 1 over 2. It's flipped. And it went from positive to negative. And so these are opposite reciprocals. Um, so they are perpendicular. Okay? And so that's what it means to show. Now this is not a proof because it's not formal. This is like that one chunk of the proof that actually um, where you're actually doing the calculations and drawing some conclusions. So again, this doesn't represent all the proof or a formal proof, but at least it's like a skeleton of one. Um, the second part um, um, is a congruency piece. Now congruency talks about length, and so again, we're going to bring in the distance formula or Pythagorean theorem. Um, what I think I'm going to do is actually bring in the Pythagorean theorem, because again, we have triangles on the grid. Um, so let's go to AB really quick. Um, so using the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Okay. Um, we just have to kind of bring in the pieces. So we have 2 squared plus 4 squared equals c squared. Um, and then simplifying, we have 4 plus 16. Uh, so that would be 20. Um, and then of course, we're going to square root both sides. And so c is just going to be the square root of 20. I'm not going to actually take this all the way down to a decimal. I'll t explain why in a second. Um, let's go ahead and move on to CD then. Okay, uh, so CD, CD, again, we're going to use Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Whoa. Okay, um, looking at our, our purple triangle, we're going to ha actually have the same exact numbers. So we have 2 squared plus 4 squared equals C squared. And again, I'm, I'm getting those numbers right off that purple triangle here at the top. Um, so in terms of simplifying, we'll end up with 4, oh, excuse me, just 4 plus 16 equals C squared. So 20 equals C squared. Uh, so simplifying by square root of both sides, C is just going to be the square root of 20. Okay. Um, now, do recall, or, or please recall, or please note, um, hopefully I made this change before I printed it. Uh, I printed it, excuse me. Uh, this actually, this should actually say also congruent. And so if yours doesn't, please make sure you change that. That's what it's supposed to say. Okay, that are also congruent. Um, and so we knew that the slopes were perpendicular because it turned out to be opposite reciprocals. Um, but now we've definitely proven that these are going to be congruent. Uh, because they're the same length. Now it's important to note here um, that you can, you, you could bring these down to decimals if you wanted to. But the point of this was just to prove that they are the same value. And at this point we have, they're both the square root of 20. Um, which is kind of the nice part about proofs. Like you don't actually have to bring the calculation down to like an algebraic level. You just have to show something is the case. And in this particular example, we've shown that both um, side lengths are the same, square root of 20. Okay? So A, B, and C, D are both perpendicular and the same length. All right. Um, so for number three, um, a very similar thing. We're not trying to find the perimeter, although I could ask you to do that. Um, what I'm, we're trying to figure out that um, we're trying to figure out at least show is that we have some relationships. Um, in particular, we, we're trying to show that some things are going to be perpendicular. I'm sorry, uh, not perpendicular, um, but they're also going to be parallel. Um, so it's important that maybe we kind of mark where these things are. We have DQ 
which is along the top, so mark that in pink. We have AU, uh, which is going to be the bottom. And we have to show those are parallel. Uh, let's continue to processing to process here. Um, looks like we were, we want to relate DQ again. Um, and then relate that to QU, this guy, and show those are not perpendicular. Um, now, they certainly don't look perpendicular in the same way that DQ and AU look parallel. Um, but when you're talking about proof, when you're talking about showing, you have to go beyond just what you're perceiving, and you actually have to show evidence as the case. Um, and so if we're going to show perpendicularity, and we're going to show perp um, non-perpendicularity, excuse me, and parallelism, um, just like the previous example, we're going to have to pick out the right formula. For parallel and perpendicular, it's all about the slopes and interpreting, so that's what we're going to use. We'll bring in some slope formulas. Um, just like before, it, it makes sense to use Pythagorean theorem, or at least um, the right triangles from the Pythagorean theorem, because we can do some counting. Um, here we have our old friend up 2 over 4. That seems to pop out a lot. Along the right-hand side uh, for QU, we'll make another triangle. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Um, so it looks like it's over 7, down 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, and the last we have to consider is on the bottom. So again, making a triangle so we can um, find slope easily. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So that's 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 5. Okay, um, so finding or showing parallel and perpendicularity are all about finding the slopes. Um, so let's just jump right into that. Let's get some slopes in. Um, so for DQ, um, the slope is going to be change in Y over change in X. And looking at our diagram, looks like it's going to be up 2 and then over 4, which is the same thing as positive 1 half. Positive makes sense because it's going uphill. Okay, uh, let's look at QU. Um, using the same exact formula, change in y over change in x, because that's what a slope is. Um, the change in y is going to be a drop 4, because it's going down, and then at the same time it's running over 7. And so dq's for, uh, slope will be negative 4 over 7. Again, we're going to leave in um, fraction form, because that's actually just more convenient to work with. Um, last one is going to be au. Um, again, change in y over change in x. Um, so that's going to be change in y plus 5, change in x 10, um, and that's going to be reduced to a half. And so we're asked to do a couple things here. We're asked to show that pink and purple, uh, d, q, and a, u are per parallel. Um, and so we can certainly do that here. And so we'll make a little mark here that these are going to be parallel because slopes are the same. Okay, so that's the first question. The second one is show pink and orange or pink and yellow are not perpendicular. Um, so if you look at these slopes, um, these are not perpendicular because they are not opposite reciprocals. Okay, opposite reciprocals mean the fraction is flipped and you change signs. And all these, although these have changed signs because one is positive, one is negative. They're not opposite reciprocals. One's not the flip version of the other. Um, and so um, those are not perpendicular. So again, these aren't exactly proof, um, but these are kind of the parts of proof that are really important. Um, the only thing that's really miss missing is uh, the formality of what a proof really is. Uh, but for homework practices, like this is the core part I want you to uh, practice. Okay, um, so moving on to number four, we want to analyze the diagram below and identify some pieces. Um, so the first thing they want us to identify is two sets of congruent segments. Uh, two sets, two sets, let me, let me make this a tad bit darter, darker, uh, because it's very easy to maybe just pick one and kind of ignore that direction. So we're going to pick two sets of things that are congruent. Uh, congruent means they are the same exact length. And so what we're hunting for on this diagram um, are tick marks, because that's how we tell congruency. Um, and so we have a set of congruencies here because they're marked with the same number of tick marks. Um, we actually have another set here, and these are actually the same as the green ones because um, they're marked the same way. Um, then we have another set here of segments. Um, now you may, may be thinking, hey, what about these angles here? Aren't these marked to be congruent as well? They are, but this question asks specifically for segments, and so we have to respect what they're asking for. And so really I can pick any two of the three sets. 
Um, let's go to the green one first. CJ um, is congruent to JH using proper notation, using the segment notation on top of the letters. Um, tell us we're looking at segments. That's one set. The pink set would be CK. So you can do a better job color coding here. Uh, the pink set would be CK uh, congruent to KD. Um, and this purple set, or this dark blue set, excuse me, um, would be uh, EF congruent to FG. And so we find those um, along the tops here. Uh, let me go back and change these. Well, that would drive me crazy. CJ and JH. Okay. And so uh, you just need two sets, but I gave you all three just in case, uh, just to maybe match your answers. Um, so then the second thing is we need two points that serve as bisectors. Um, so, and this is a very easy point to mistake. Bisectors have to cut a single thing in half. Um, and we, I, we actually have three examples of bisectors here. Uh, the only three acceptable ones are J. That's a bisector because it cuts these two pieces in half. Uh, another version would be K. And K is acceptable because it cuts this one line into two equal pieces. Um, and the only other one that's acceptable would be this ray here. Um, and the reason why that would be acceptable is because it cuts these angles in half. Um, it, F is not a bisector. And it's important to note this is probably one of the most mistaken parts uh, of this study, is that is not, and I'll make it big, not a bisector. Okay, This is not a bisector because it doesn't cut one thing in half. It, it, it separates two congruent parts. And so this guy right here, and I'll wait to use a minute, this guy right here are congruent, but they're not the same thing that's been sliced in half. It's just two segments that happen to intersect at F. And so when you're looking for a bisector, you're looking at like a whole piece, like this was a whole piece, and then J came in and cut it in half. That's what a bisector is. It cuts something in half that's already there. And so in terms of bisectors, and since we did ask for points here, the only answers I can accept are J and K. Um, this ray that I have outlined here does bisect an angle, but the question is asking for two points to serve as bisectors, and that's actually going to be a ray that cuts a thing in half. Okay, um, so we can take that thinking here. We need one set of per parallel lines, one set of perpendicular segments. Um, so parallel lines are going to be marked. Oh man, here we go. Uh, are going to be marked with chevrons or, or triangles. Um, these are actually going to be our parallel markings right here, uh, these guys. And so we just have to identify the two lines that those are a part of. Um, so it looks like on the left-hand side I have line US. And again, let's make sure we're using proper notation of a line. Parallel, um, the two slash marks, to WB. Okay, we need one set of perpendicular. Let's change colors on this. Uh, so let's say perpendicular is going to be green. So we're looking for a perpendicular marker. Here's a perpendicular marker, the right-hand marker. And so we just have to name the segments that these are a part of. And it looks like we're going to deal with TU, and we'll also be dealing with TFs. Those are the segments that are meeting a 90-degree angle. So TU, segment, perpendicular, TS, boom, there we go. Uh, we need three sets of congruent constructors. And again, this is all boils down to just understanding what mark on the diagram means congruent. Um, congruencies are marked by tick marks. So there's one set of congruencies, here's a second set of congruencies, and they're actually all congruent to one another. Um, the, the last set's actually going to be a little bit difficult to find maybe, but we're talking actually about these angles. Um, they're marked with arcs, that's how angles work, um, but those are going to be the three sets. Okay, so let's go and get these down. And so the first two sets are segments, and so let's start over here with VX. So VX, using proper notation of a segment with line over, line segment over it, um, is congruent to WV this guy right here. Um, on the left hand side we have TS congruent to TU. Uh, and the last set is going to be angles. So switch colors to match the angles. Um, so we have this angle TUS congruent to this angle UST. And this set of three. Um, so you can kind of expect this to be on the test as well. Like we talked a lot on this homework about notation, different ways to represent things. Um, so that's going to definitely be there. All right, um, let's get to some sketching. I saw these trapezoid. Uh, so now we're kind of combining a descriptor with the thing itself. Um, recall isosceles means that two sides are going to be congruent. 
trapezoid is just a shape with at least one set of parallel sides. And so a good picture would be something like this, where these are going to be congruent and these are marked to be parallel. That's a good isosceles triangle. I'm sorry, trapezoid. Um, scaling triangle. When you look at the term scaling, that means all the sides are different. Triangle, of course, means you have three pieces. Um, so as long as all three of these are in different lengths, wow, um, are in different lengths, there we go, um, we have a scaling triangle. If you want to mark it to bring it home, you mark all three sides to be different implicitly using different number of tick marks. Um, right triangle, well, that just means we have a right angle. And so here's an example of right triangle. Marked, of course, because show it has to have a right angle. Okay, uh, diagonals, opposite angles, and bisector. Okay, so diagonals. Um, so we, if we have a shape, um, say like a rectangle, um, diagonals are simply connecting one corner to the other. Those are diagonals. Um, using the same uh, rectangle as an example, opposite angles are going to be those that appear not consecutively like in a row, uh, but opposite one another. Those are opposite angles. There is another set of opposites, uh, these guys right here. Those are opposites because, again, they're kind of across each other. Um, if you look at these two ideas side by side, um, they're related. Um, so if you have diagonals, they actually touch opposite angle to opposite angle. Um, and that's one way you can tell. Um, and vice versa, if you have opposite angles, it's where you connect the diagonals of the shape. Um, bisector we just talked about in a previous example, but that's okay. We can talk about it again. Um, so we have a bisector. Um, if you have something, one thing, one constructor, um, that you cut into two congruent parts, like right there and right there, that guy is your bisector. Okay, And so it's important we're familiar with the terminology of geometry, and so um, this is just terminology and shape stuff. Okay, um, Now this is a little tougher because you have to match the definition that you had or that you've been building. Um, so if we notice here we have a quadrilateral with four sides, and those four sides are congruent, um, but we don't know anything about these angles. The most we can call this guy is a rhombus. Okay, um, so rhombus is by definition are a quadrilateral, a polygon, meaning that we have enclosed sides. Um, and I know this picture got cut off a little bit right there, but we have enclosed, it's two dimensional, uh, made of only straight sides um, that are further restricted because it only has four sides um, and all the sides are congruent. We're going to call it guy rhombus. This one's unusual, but if you notice, we have two set sides here that are congruent and two sides here that are congruent. Um, we're actually going to call this a kite. This is a more unusual version of a kite. It's called a convex kite, or quite concave kite, um, but it's kite nevertheless because it fits the definition of having two sets of sides that are congruent. Um, these two are in a row touching in the same, and these ones at the bottom are in a row touching in the same. Okay. Um, finally, we've reached the last section. We'll talk some algebra. Um, so here we have to solve a problem and then round each of our answers to three decimal points. Um, that's pretty straightforward. I see you grab my calculator here. Um, so the first one is we just have to resolve the square root. And so in our calculator, if we take the square root of 40, um, we're going to end up with 6 six and some decimal change. Um, we're rounding to three decimals, so we'll end up with 6.3245. Um, um, so to round, we'll look at, if we want to round to that this digit, we have to look at the last one. That one actually will kick it up. And so we're actually looking at 6.325. Um, so on the second one, there is a negative involved, but it's outside the square root. Um, so we'll start by taking the square root of 95, um, which is 9.74679. Uh, I think it should be 92. Um, and so this negative just comes out in front as well. Now in terms of rounding, uh, round to three decimals. So look at the fourth one. That one will, will round up. And so we're actually looking at 9.74. Okay, um, here we have a, a half solved Pythagorean theorem problem, looks like. Um, so we have 4 squared, which is 16, 8 squared, which is 64, and that's equal to c squared. 16 and 64 make 80. Um, and so to solve this, uh, we need to square root our last step. Um, and so the c value is the same as the square root of 80, which we can approximate. So we have 80 square root. Um, and so I'm going to skip right to the rounding part. This should be 8.944. Right. Um, so this one we're going to have to do some square rooting separately. So if I take the square root of 10, 
Um, that approximates to 3.162. Um, um, if we take the square root of 8, that's going to be 2.828. And so we just add these together. Okay, we'll end up with uh, 5.990. Oh. Yep. Okay, now if you were to do all the rounding in your calculator, you might end up with a slightly different answer like 991, and that's within the margin of error, and that's okay. All right, um, second set, we need to find the slope in each of the following. And so um, it's important to note here, like this is not actually given in proper form, uh, at least an equation form that's used to us. And so ideally, we'd want to work it back to something like y equals mx plus b. Um, so we can do that here in this equation. The only thing that's uh, wrong is that this 3x is kind of in the wrong place. It's a negative 3x, so just like anything, we're going to add 3x to both sides to kind of manipulate our equation. Um, those are gone, bringing down just y equals. Now don't fall into the trap of making this 13x's. These aren't like terms. That's a 10. That has an x. You can't combine them, but you can write them together. And so what I mean is we can bring down the, the 3x, and then we can add 10 to the end of it. Now, the reason that's important is because now it's actually in y equals mx plus b form. Um, and so we do have a slope here that's going to be 3 because it follows the form of y equals mx plus b, and 3 is in front of that x. Ergo, that's got to be our slope. Okay. Um, this one actually is in form. This is what in what's called uh, point slope form. Uh, x minus x1. Okay. It's a legit form from algebra, if you recall. Um, and here, we, again, we just have to know where to look. And so we have... Um, the n in the same position as 4 fifths, and so it's reasonable to conclude that the slope in this case is going to be 4 fifths. And so sometimes you have to kind of move your equation around to make it work. Um, other times you just have to recognize it's what you got. Now if you didn't recognize it on this one, you could have done the same thing as the previous, um, and getting all the numbers off to the right-hand side. It's just you have more algebra to mess with, and so um, knowing the forms is a good thing. Here's almost a gimme at this point. Uh, we just need to pick out a couple values um, and, and find the change in y over change in x. Um, and so the slope in this case, the change in y, is going to be 2. At the same time, man, we're over 4. How much do we like 2 and 4? Uh, and so the slope in this case is going to be 1 half. Now, this all makes sense because it's a positive number, 1 half, so it is going uphill. Um, and certainly it's going to be at the clip of up 1 over 2, up 1 over 2, up 1 over 2, up 1 over 2 making that our slope. All right, uh, last section, finally we got here. We need to do some solving. Um, and so I'm going to try to trick you with a bunch of algebra, but you passed algebra last year because you're in geometry, so this should be no issue at all. You just got to kind of knock the rust off a little bit. Um, so here we have some distribution work. So we were multiplying 4 through some parentheses. Um, so we have to do that. 4 times x gives us x. 4 times 2 gives us 8. Okay. On the right-hand side, again, we're going to be multiplying through. Negative 2 times x is negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 10, two negatives make a positive, and so that's going to be plus 20. Um, so now we've reduced the difficulty of this problem, because all we have to do now is start to move things around. Um, so the first thing I'm probably going to move around is this negative 2x. I'll add 2x to both sides to keep our numbers all positive. Um, so this will end up being like 6x plus 8. These are gone. Equals 20. So now we continue the, this, uh, this line of action here. Uh, we have a plus 8, so we'll get rid of it by subtracting 8. And so, oops, we'll end up with 6x on this side, 20 minus 8 is 12 on that one. And so we're really, really close here. Um, looks like the last, only, last thing we have to do is do some, oh, that's what we're reading, um, do some dividing because we have times 6, so let's divide by 6. 6's um, are gone, and so x is the same as 12 divided by 6, which is just 2. Um, so we call that from, from last year, if you're um, looking at some algebra pieces, um, this is just basic solving, so we've got to make sure we're still good at this um, throughout and even after geometry. Um, this one fast forwards a little bit, so um, with here we just have to kind of deal with moving x's around. Um, so we have a 5x on one side, a 6x on the other. I tend to always get rid of the smaller, smaller group. Um, and the smaller group is this positive 5x, so we'll subtract 5x, uh, because that is how you undo things like that. Um, so we're just left with a 4 on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, 6x's take away 5x's, leave you with a single x. Um, we'll subtract 8. Um, so we got to keep going here. So we have a minus 8. We'll undo it by adding 8, because, um, again, things are undone by applying the opposite. 
Uh, 4 plus 8 is 12, and that just leaves us with x, so that actually is our answer, because once we get to x equals, we're good to go. And it looks like 12 equals x. Uh, so again, here's one where we might have to go to our calculator, but we're just trying to get x. And so this is uh, certainly not the first time we've done a problem like this. And so we have to start taking away all the things around x, so we can get x by itself. The first thing is it times 2, so let me divide by 2. Uh, so x squared in this case is equal to 450 divided by 2. Um, so certainly this is something you could totally do in your head. If not, grab a calculator and you'll find it to be 225. Uh, one last step is that we got to kill the square, but you guys know how we're going to do that. We're just going to apply a square root. And so if we apply a square root, we end up with the square root of 225, which is 15. Now, please keep in mind, um, it is true that 15 times 15 is 225. But it's also true that negative 15 times negative 15 is 225, and so we have to include that as part of our answer set as well. All right? um, so again, use these videos properly, pause it, fast forward. I don't expect you guys to watch the whole thing wall to wall. That's a lot of video to watch, um, but that is the entirety of the key three. And so again, if you think about what's going to be on the test, um, think about the, the, what the things are always asking you to do. Um, it seems like every single homework I've asked you to think about parallel lines, perpendicular lines, and also applying those to do something like find perimeter. We talked about notation over and over and over again, not just generating it yourself, but recognizing, recognizing it. Um, we, we've had three homework pieces now that are entirely about shapes, so you can expect to know some stuff about shapes. Um, and then we, I've asked you to do three types of algebra problems for the last couple weeks, rounding, finding slopes, and solving equations. So that's going to be on the test too. All right, so again, hope this helps. Watch it over, watch it over if you need it. Um, if not, I'll see you next time.